Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the annual lecture for Scotland, The New Space Economy, a great title for a lecture. Um, this is a, a very healthy and growing space economy sector globally, and that's largely driven by uh, interest from the citizens of the world in using space technology to solve pressing problems, uh, climate change being the, the obvious one, uh, shrinking barriers to entry, uh, creating more opportunities to explore space. Uh, and then thirdly, and relevant today, uh, I think Scotland's space sector is rising faster than anywhere else in the UK, suggesting it could be a launch pad for economic growth post-COVID, uh, while providing data solutions to help tackle climate change. So uh, really looking forward to uh, this year's annual lecture. And uh, thank you to uh, Amazon Web Services for sponsoring today's event. Uh, and supporting uh, Digital Leaders Week in Scotland. Uh, but it gives me enormous pleasure to invite up our annual lecturer, and that is Tom Soderstrom. Tom is Global Lead uh, for uh, and Chief Technologist in the public sector. Uh, he leads uh, the Chief Global Chief Technologist team uh, for the public sector. It's a team of business-focused technology business advisors to public sector executives, CTOs, and to AWS leaders. And they identify and evolve emerging technology trends and patterns and help solve deep technical problems. Uh, before that, from 2006 to 2020, uh, 2020, Tom served as the IT Chief Technology and Innovation Officer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL, where he helped to find support and implement innovative space missions, emerging IT trends, and mentor the next generation of IT and space explorers. Um, so you can see from that why he is uh, the perfect lecturer for us today. And Tom, I'm going to invite you up onto stage to join me. And uh, while he's on his way up, I think Tom is going to give a lecture for about 20 minutes. And then uh, we have an, uh, an expert panel who I'll introduce later that will be uh, joining Tom to discuss the content uh, of his lecture. So Tom, I'll just let you get your slides ready. And then, uh, whoops, sorry. No problem at all. Let me fix this. How about now? Fantastic. Okay. Tom, that, that's great. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, sometimes it's easier to land on Mars than it is to get the audiovisual technology right. So I appreciate your patience. Uh, so, yes, uh, I am here because I'm passionate about space. And I hope you are or will be after this lecture and the panel that's coming after with some experts. Um, I've worked in space for a long time in my entire life. And as Chief Technology Innovation Officer at JPL, I looked at the future trends and realized that the immense computation and storage necessary was a big deal. So we partnered with AWS and were able to implement several of the big things. And I came to AWS to try to uh, impact the public sector worldwide. And uh, as chief technologist, director of chief technologist, we are global and we're trying to have an impact. So what I wanted to talk about today was why should we care about space? And why is now the time that we've titled this the new space economy? And who are the ones that will benefit? And most important, are there examples? Uh, what can we what can we do? What are we doing? What will we do? And then the fourth, what should we do next? And you'll see this little golden question mark, because uh, it really is all about the questions for each of the new sections. So first of all, this is why we overall we've cared for a long time we have to answer the big questions. And the big questions are, how do we protect Mother Earth? And I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on that. How would we direct and redirect an asteroid? And if we couldn't, which would be a really bad day, do we have a place to go? Is there or was there life on Mars? And where did the universe come from? Where are we going? Uh, and then most of all, interest, are we alone? So I'll. I think that with the new technologies and the new trends and with the new workforce uh, and the interest in space, we will answer some of these questions in our lifetime. And uh, that's a heavy prediction. <laughs> Hopefully I'll be 
alive long enough to see it. So why space and why now? Uh, it should be, and hopefully you believe it since you are in this lecture, that the world is entering a very new, exciting and daring new space age. The space industry is rapidly growing. It's transforming. And we're going to send uh, the first man and woman to the moon uh, for a long time. So there's interest in astronauts. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of satellites. And I'll talk about that. But it's drastically going to increase our insight to Earth and beyond. And why now? Why is there a space bubble? It's really for two reasons. Uh, one is a much more deeper interest in space because global climate change is a problem that affects us all. So the citizens of the world want to help solve this problem. And the governments of the world are saying, okay, citizens, we will respond. So there are many new space agencies being created. Also space is a terrific ambassador. Uh, we live on a very smooth, small blue dot uh, as looked at from space and it's our dot. So everybody will collaborate at least that's the hope and it's happening so there is a renewed interest and then the businesses that can participate and i'll show what they are but there's also a much lower barrier to entry uh, i compared uh, data from about 15 years ago to now and it's dramatically better so it's i'll show that on the next slide here but it really costs less to care more and that just like the universe is expanding so is the interest in space. Uh, is it a space bubble or will it just keep going and going like the universe or may not? That's for us to figure out. So just a few data points here. And uh, if you look at launch costs, uh, you can see this uh, slide from future timeline. Uh, so it's a lot cheaper to launch. Uh, and if you look at the costs from building a spacecraft to uh, because of all the CubeSats, to launching it, to tracking it, to getting the data down, storing it and analyzing it, they've come down it, today compared to 15 years ago. It's anywhere from 2% to 15% uh, of what it was then. So a lot cheaper. There are a lot of satellites in orbit. If you notice here, and there's a lot of debate on exactly how many, uh, this data shows there's 7,688 now in orbit, but only about half of them are active which means there are a lot of them that have they're no longer active so at the end i'm going to wrap up with space junk how do we help that i think that's a big problem we need to solve and there's a lot of interest in from venture capital uh the last quarter q to q1 of 2021 was a 95 percent greater investment than the 12 months prior so there's a lot of interest in space the, one of the reasons for the lower cost is that you don't have to build and own the infrastructure. You can just pay to play. And I think that's one of the most important factors here because everybody can participate. Uh, when I was at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, we used this new thing called the AWS Ground Station as a Service to track uh, a, a CubeSat. Turned out it was one of the uh, asteroid, I'm sorry, one of the uh, exoplanet CubeSats, and uh, we were able to track it. So now we could rent time on an antenna to augment our own antennas when I was at JPL. And we're seeing that industry now from AWS, uh, we're seeing an interest in this. You don't have to own the space, own it. The other piece that's really interesting is that it's worldwide. So instead of having to wait 90 minutes or so for your satellite uh, low Earth orbiter to come across, you could download at all the 12 locations, or uh, you could, if there's cloud cover and you can't get your data, you can get it at the next station. And what happens now is when you think about that at scale, you can manage constellations of spacecraft. And that's one of the big trends uh, we, we see. And if you're talking about uh, a lot of new satellites, 20,000 uh, going to be launched here, which is uh, twice as many as in the past 60 years in the next decade, you can't do it manually. You have to automate it. So there is this idea of just pay for play and you don't have to own infrastructure. Well, what about if you don't have an internet connection? Well, many companies are trying to solve that. In fact, a third of all the new satellites going up are um, to provide broadband access. 
and Amazon's Kuiper is one of them that's going to do that. And uh, 3,200 satellites going up to provide access to underserved countries and areas. And uh, it's residential users, science and research, underserved populations. So once you have access, you can then participate in this uh, democratizing of space and citizen science, which lifts everybody because now you can get people from perhaps the deepest Africa can finally participate in helping Earth, uh, protecting Mother Earth. So I think that's a really exciting development. So Scotland. Scotland is playing a really impressive part already in this new space economy. And it's on a great, great growth trajectory. Here's just a little bit of data. And uh, during the panel, uh, we have uh, Marion Scott, who is a professor of uh, statistics, who will provide lots of data. Uh, Steve Greenland is an expert on uh, quantum uh, networks. And then um, we have uh, Phil, who will be able to talk about AWS. So we'll talk more about Scotland. But already, it's 7,500 person strong talent pool. Uh, 130 space companies are operating in Scotland, whether they are emerging companies or in global. And I thought it was interesting that Glasgow produces the most CubeSats outside of California. Uh, very impressive. And launch. Launch is one of the barriers. How are we going to get launch all of these satellites? And although there are a lot of nations that are signing up, you have to have the right location. Uh, and Scotland has the right location for geosynchronous orbit and polar orbit, and a lot of uh, ocean space that you can launch over at less risk. So I think that is a fantastic opportunity. So number two, who can benefit? So the ones in blue here are the ones that can benefit, but there are many, many more. So governments will provide the things that governments do, like rapid fire detection, disaster response, and they will employ space agencies to look deeper into space and to help climate change. Legacy space companies and new space companies and startups and universities and businesses will all benefit in these new partnerships. So I think there's a lot of new business models that's going to evolve. Uh, the citizen scientists, and I'll show a few examples of this, have really started to add value to the space exploration. Because if you can access the data, and if you are creative, you can participate. Then it's no longer big data. It's huge data. We're doubling the data every two years. And we're already into zettabytes. So the managing all of this data, and that's where cloud is so well suited. You can store it all in one place. Everybody can access it. And uh, it's a lot less uh, expensive than storing it in your own data center. The ones in yellow here are the real experts. They are the ones that will benefit us uh, as we es evolve space. Now, what are some of the examples? So let's start outside and come back home to Earth. Could we find Earth 2.0? If we should need it, it would be a bad day, but we need to find it. And already, there are over 4,000 exoplanets, meaning an extrasolar planet, a planet that orbits its sun, just like we orbit ours. And uh, yes, we can find it. And the way you detect it is to look at the wobble in the energy, looking at this fixed spot of time. It takes a lot of computation power. Uh, so the cloud, again, is well suited for that. So far, are there a place that you could live where liquid water is liquid, the Goldilocks zone? There are 28 Earth-like exoplanets found so far. And at JPL, there is a little display that shows that updates every time there is a new one uh, being found. And crowdsourcing is a good way to find these exoplanets where you can uh, be able to look at the data and identify new ones. Europa, uh, going a little closer to Jupiter, it's not that close, but, um, and it takes, uh, is there life on Europa? Uh, Europa is the moon of Jupiter and it has ice sheets, uh, hundreds of kilometers thick, but there are lakes in the ice sheets. That's a likely place to house life if there is life out there. And uh, NASA is already uh, funded a mission to a clipper, Europa Clipper, to look for it. So what we did when I was at JPL is say, how can we schedule these big antennas, the 70 meters? And we used quantum computing and we used uh, reinforcement learning to try to come up with new algorithms to do it faster. 
And uh, the idea here was to experiment with new technologies, quantum uh, and reinforcement learning. And we could do that without having to own the equipment because we just rented space on uh, this case bracket, AWS uh, quantum computer. Mars, Mars is a wonderful place. It's a scary place. And we now have our new rover there. So there is uh, this, hopefully you can see it spin. Uh, this is what Perseverance looked like. It landed in February and it's doing a marvelous job rolling across Mars. It has a uh, new wheel so it can go higher and it's looking new instruments to so look for the, the signs of life or past life on Mars. And as it finds these samples that are interesting, it's going to first, it shoots the rock with laser, then it drills if it finds something interesting, then it drops it behind for a future mission to come roll out to get it, shoot it up to an orbiter that will take it back to Earth where scientists will uh, look at this, about half a kilo of materials. Very exciting. Um, and they're using AWS to process the data because they could be sped up so all the scientists across the world can look at it. So again, cloud was very helpful in uh, such an important mission that cloud is now mission critical, but it's saving time and money and scientists time. It has a little friend, and hopefully you've all seen the helicopter fly. What's the uh, Ingenuity helicopter uh, was a technology and is a technology experiment that did not impact a major mission. And I think that's how we have to think about this. So new business models, insert a technology experiment onto a cheap, inex inexpensive, interesting technology experience with a major mission. And now next time that is proven and has flown, so it becomes the major mission. So with uh, Ingenuity, now we know that we can explore foreign planets by flying into craters, flying up where rovers can't go, and what new modality can we find to explore these planets? Creativity is the only barrier, and there's no shortage of that. So let's come home. So enabling the next generation of space builders is really key here. Anything, when you look at data from space, so if you look at Earth from space, you get a different context, a much larger point of view. And over time, you get a very good point of view. Like, is there any question that the ice sheets are melting? No, they're melting. So how do we prevent it? Because we can look at data from many, many years ago at that context. So agriculture, national defense, Earth observation, these are all helped. Then an interesting one, digital twins and smart cities. When you look at a digital twin, you can look at a digital twin of just an instrument or a set of instruments or a spacecraft or a city or a country. And if we think about the spacecraft, uh, you can, in the simulation in a digital twin, you can inject faults and you can experiment and you can try uh, until you solve the problems, then you deploy it on the hardware. This is uh, how most things will be done, uh, robotics, smart cities, et cetera, and it will make it safer and much more productive. And it's, so digital twinning, <laughs> that's a term, uh, is a really big thing to experiment with. Water is the key to life on Earth as well as in space. These are two NASA instruments, uh, SWAT and NISAR with uh, collaboration. And what's interesting here is they will map the Earth uh, same spot of the Earth every two weeks. So they can measure the water content, even down to small reservoirs, helping uh, farmers uh, and everybody else who's affected by droughts or floods. Um, and they collect 100 times more data than the missions that came before them. So storing it in the cloud, which is what they're doing, will make it possible for everybody else to share that data. That's key to the new space economy. And then using space, to bring you closer to Earth much faster. So Capella Space is one company and it uses satellite data within minutes of capture as opposed to 24 hours later that uh, was common. So you can now see things in near real time. Another example is uh, wildfires. I live in California, that's where I'm talking from. Uh, California, Australia, we've had really bad wildfires recently. So Fireball International is one example where they can look at uh, a spot and they can detect these wildfires as they start within minutes and get uh, first responders deployed, firefighters, 
and put out these fires. Uh, that's the hope. They have the capability. Uh, now we'll see. Uh, but it should help prevent, uh, save lives and structure damage. Should help that. This one is more of a citizen science thing. Um, in California, we also have earthquakes. <laughs> Rough place. <laughs> and uh, two years ago, there was an earthquake. What we have done uh, when I was at JPL is to automate so that the uh, one database was looking at earthquakes above a certain Richter scale. It triggered JPL to spin up servers in AWS that looked at the recent uh, images from satellites and did an interferogram to overlay the earth movement uh, or surface deformation and then send that out to everybody who were interested. One of them was somebody named Eric Fielding. He was studying uh, earthquake faults. And if you see about two o'clock going down towards the middle, that's a new earthquake fault that he found. And he then sent that out to his followers. So completely automated, uh, a new earthquake fault was detected and nobody had to own any hardware to do this. Uh, I think that's the power of citizen science. So now then, what should we do next? What's the call to action? Well, we should all sign up to the Paris Accord. Uh, it is a commitment to a sustainable future where uh, Amazon is doing their part, have signed up to be net carbon, uh, net zero carbon by 2040, 100% renewable energy by 2025, and pledging $2 million, $2 billion, to help others innovate within this space of uh, reducing carbon to help our planet. So that's one thing. Another one is to help democratize space where we make it accessible to everybody. Hopefully you will see the JPL open source rover here driving across uh, a bunch of rocks. It was to kids and saying, stump the rover. So go collect rocks, which is good. They also got tired, <laughs> so they listen. But it was created so that students could learn programming, engineering, robotics, and science, and have to collaborate. Uh, and it became part of high school courses. The key here for us was uh, at JPL, once we left this, could the community sustain it? And I checked yesterday, and it has doubled uh, since uh, we left. And that's really powerful. So creating a self-sustaining space community uh, is powerful. This cost $2,500 of parts to build, and many people have innovated to make it much cheaper. Um, the other thing we did is to run this open uh, challenge with uh, AWS and then JPL at the time to look, teach it reinforcement learning, which is difficult to do. Uh, but we had 300 people put to, to complete the challenge. It was to drive on Mars with all of the uh, factors of Mars embedded. And uh, it was to simulate, of course. And it worked. So there was a winner, a young man from Australia. And I think these type of challenges sparks the imagination. The other piece that we recently did is to have a space accelerator challenge. This was by AWS and Seraphim, uh, which is a space uh, investor firm. So AWS and Seraphim encouraged startups to help answer the big questions. There were 193 applications and 10 winners, and they are now receiving hands-on training uh, and expert advice uh, and how to scale afterwards. They also got up to $100,000 of credits for how to use cloud computing uh, and the newest tools in cloud computing from AWS. So encouraging these startups is really key to what we need to do, because who will be the next big company? Uh, probably one of these, or hopefully more than one. And as you can see here, the 10 companies are focused in different areas, self-sustaining space operations like Lunar Outpost, having autonomous rovers on the moon, uh, managing satellites in orbit with Leo Labs, the orbit and cognitive space, all adding interesting parts. Sustainability and climate change by Discard Lab and Satellite View, helping industries to make rapid decisions. This is for industry. So orbital sidekick and versa space, and then improving crisis response, which when we need it, we really need it fast. Hawkeye and EGBs are taking different types of data and overlaying it. And then EGB is using uh, augmented reality so the first responders can see what's behind the smoke. So all of these are very innovative companies uh, 
that are doing very interesting things in their space. One day, they may grow up to be a mature space company like Maxar. Uh, they are, Maxar is creating three point, they are creating, they've created, sorry, over 125 petabytes of data that they have in archive that other innovators should now be able to access and do interesting things with analytics, machine learning, et cetera. They are, every day, they can cover 3.8 million square kilometers. That's a lot. Uh, it adds over a billion over a year. And what I found interesting about this is they started focused and now they have grown. So what you're seeing there is a picture of Edinburgh Castle taken by uh, Maxar. Uh, you can overlay it on your smartphone. They helped uh, create the robotic arm and they're providing the uh, coverage for the Tokyo Olympics. So it's once you get started in space, you can grow in many different directions. Then we just release the key industry trends. And these are the ones that we should all pay attention to because these are industry wide. Um, and if I look at the technology needs here, uh, edge computing, being productive in the hybrid office, being able to trust the cloud and to trust that the data will stay in your country, uh, advanced robotics and simulation, uh, and then augmenting the reality of everything. Uh, is a key. Experimenting with advanced technologies like quantum computing, quantum networking, where uh, Scott Greenman will talk with us about quantum uh, networking in the panel. Then environmental and social governance is something that we all have to pay attention to and we should pay attention to. And it's, it's one of the key trends. The employees are saying we need to work for a company that's environmentally and socially responsible. The big trend is smarter everything. It's about, it's not enough to have a smart city. The city needs to become smarter. The spacecraft needs to become smarter with more data, faster access to data and lower latency and better machine learning and AI. I think that's where we will all benefit. So what should we do next here? Uh, seven recommendations, join the new space economy experiment and quickly evolve these technologies because we don't have to own it anymore. We can experiment at scale inexpensively. Automate everything with that many spacecraft and that many opportunities and that much data, it has to be automated. We're telling all of our startups and ourselves to focus. Focus on the things we do well, then partner with others for the bigger picture, collaborate, augment their results, and then share and publish not just the results, but the data so that other people can add value to it. Um, there is no limit to what we can imagine. In fact, Disney, Walt Disney said, if you can imagine it, you can do it. And that's the same thing about the use cases for space data. We're just in the infancy. So imagine that you had all the data and all the compute power that you needed. What could you do? The number six there is a scary one. We have to reduce and remove space debris. Uh, there was a study by University of Glasgow, Fujitsu Astroscale and AWS, and the G7 that showed that there's 900,000 items, uh, space junk, essentially. And at the G7 Leader Summit, uh, they focused on space debris and saying that, yes, we need to uh, remove it, uh, including the UK had a big voice and a big part and will play a very large part in this, I think. Then... Uh, help answer the big questions in our lifetime. So we're going from passive observation to active participation. And that's really the essence of the space economy. So finally, we just need to expand our belief system. It's not about finding answers to existing questions. That's a part of it. It's about inferring and answering new questions using this new technology and the creativity and the global workforce. And uh, I thank you and I welcome your feedback or your comments uh, or your criticism uh, anytime. So thank you for listening and hopefully you'll all join us in this uh, next panel that will talk about uh, some deeper topics in space. So that concludes my remarks and I thank you. Brilliant, Tom, thank you so much. You've got us off to a flying start uh, with the annual lecture. So let's bring your panel up. So. Um, I'll bring them up one at a time just to do introductions. So first off, we have Professor Marion Scott, 
Uh, she's Professor of Environmental Statistics in the School of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of Glasgow. She's an elected member of the International Statistical Institute uh, and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and a Chartered Statistician of the Royal Statistical Society. Uh, next, welcome, Marion. Next, we Thank have you. Steve Greenland. Uh, he's MD at Craft Prospect. Uh, Steve has 14 years leading innovative projects in the Scottish space industry, uh, from proposing and delivering as technical lead Scotland's first satellite, U-Cube-1. Uh, he's helping to establish Glasgow as a nano satellite cap capital, uh, through to establishing mission labs for new space labs and internationally. 2017, Steve took the entrepreneurial pill himself, establishing two space companies, Calf Crafts Prospect, focuses on upstream next generation technologies for space missions in AI and quantum physics and Omanus Analytics, empowering global communities with downstream Earth observation derived intelligence. And our last panelist is Phil Cooper from Aerospace Satellite at Amazon Web Services. Phil is the regional manager for aerospace and satellite solutions in EMEA with a 20 year background in the Earth observation and geospatial industry. Phil has extensive commercial experience working for Airbus Defence and Space, where he secured contracts in insurance, utilities, and government sectors. And Phil then went on to manage and grow one of the fastest growing EO software companies in the UK, Sterling Geo, uh, before joining AWS in 2019. So welcome, panel. Um, so fantastic lecture by Tom. Uh, Marion, some opening thoughts about uh, what you've just heard. So, a great lecture. Um, I guess my perspective comes from um, the appetite to use the data. Uh, I'm not a technical um, satellite person in the sense of, you know, building them or launching them or anything like that. It's actually what we can do with the products of the satellites that we have already orbiting Earth. Uh, and Tom touched on a few of those in terms of things like um, water across the globe. Uh, that's an area that um, we've been working in with, with colleagues. Um, we talked about climate change and um, we talked about hazards. So my real interest lies in, as I said, the, the use of the data and the ability to answer these questions and to allow us to do um, things in terms of things like responding to hazards and so on, which previously might have been um, very slow and very difficult to actually acquire the information that we needed to make the decisions as rapidly as we did. So that's really, as I said, where I'm coming from. Um, and I think that Tom has done a, an excellent job in identifying where some of those big global issues are that um, the space economy really is um, opening up our opportunities to address. Thank you. Steve. Thanks, Robin, and, and thanks, Tom, for a fascinating lecture. Um, for me, then, it was the, the theme of kind of what happens next. Um, for myself, getting into the new space economy and, and pretty much spending my whole career within it, um, we've seen CubeSats go from kind of interesting educational tools, or they won't do anything, through to niche applications, and now really kind of network data nodes within, within this new global economy. Um, and so what, what is next um, and what, how, do we, how do we use these systems more efficiently? They're very limited uh, resources potentially, so we need to collect as much data as possible, be able to rapidly process that, um, get it down to the users who are able to make uh, informed decisions based upon it. And that requires all sorts of different skills. Um, and so for, for a company like mine, then bringing together these different skill sets. So, so we have quantum physicists, we have space engineers, we have cybersecurity experts, AI as well, and seeing what new ideas can come out by mixing these together, developing uh, new skills between them um, and, and just taking it from there, really. Brilliant. Thanks, Steve and Phil. Uh, yes, I mean, I think probably from my, my perspective, it's obviously more of the commercial slant on things. Um, we talk a lot about the, the volume of data doubling every two years. Um, and that is uh, no different in, in our sector with Earth observation data or IoT data. Uh, what we're seeing at the moment, we are um, 
in the midst of a titanic shift really to the cloud um, and the volume of data that's coming in and the applications and services which 20 30 years ago were the preserve of the science and research departments of, of places is now um, in the mainstream of commerce and uh, in particular in scotland we're seeing more and more companies appearing who are developing applications and services from that eo data what we call the downstream applications and, and services um, much is talked about on upstream the launch the, the very visible um, space launches that take place uh, what i'm always looking at is the downstream expansion and um, i think in the next two three four years we're going to see uh, even faster acceleration and, and uh, even greater growth in, in big data sets. And uh, yeah, it's an exciting time to be involved. Tom, have you got any sort of initial things to add from your to your lecture sort of based on what our panel have just uh, said? Yeah, I think um, all, when you look at the industry trends, uh, that's brand new. We just put that out and that really welcome feedback. There is a mixture. One of the ones that we haven't seen before is the ESG, the environmental, social, and governance. And what that means is we're going to get a lot, a lot wider swath of people uh, interested. And I think that's really key. There are girls that code in the US, for instance. There is, uh, and if you look at the Ingenuity uh, spacecraft, um, uh, Mimi Ong was the project manager. So we're seeing a, a, a broadening of interest in space and also a broadening of interest. I think Steve's point about the variety of skills is really important. So it's uh, it's proven that the uh, a diverse group is more productive than a non-diverse group. But that's diversity of uh, everything, including age. So being able to have this new space companies and new space employees with experienced employees and pairing them together it, mentoring them is going to make us move much much faster and i think uh phil's point about big data is absolutely right but the exciting part here when we meet next year what new job titles were created that didn't exist today what new uh, uses of space data came and I've already seen some, but we're just scratching the surface. And I think Marion is going to give us a very interesting point of view about all this data and statistically what has happened, what means, what matters. So to me, there's no question that the space bubble or the econ growing space economy is partially technical, but also much wider participation from the world. Brilliant. Thanks, Tom. Um, I've got a few sort of specific questions. Um, Steve, I'll come to you first, but everyone else can join in. Uh, you know, given the title of our lecture, how has the new space economy emerged in Scotland? What's what what? So, yeah. from my my perspective, was um, leaving university um, sixteen years ago, not not wanting to get what might be considered a traditional job in the space industry, and seeing. CubeSats emerge um, in the US and in Japan, um, going out to Japan for uh, a couple of years. And then I was fortunate enough to be invited to come back to, to Glasgow um, to, to look at setting up um, the first uh, satellite program within Scotland, which, which was to become YouTube One. And for me, in terms of the upstream technologies, although there was already kind of lots of, lots of downstream and uh, military uh, and defense type applications, but the real kind of new space economy really started with a company called Clyde Space, um, bringing, bringing together a, a small team to develop the first CubeSats and then to start uh, selling the different components, which really enabled lots of universities across the world to purchase these components, bring them together into their own satellites and start performing their own missions. Um, and 16 or so years on, we see that Glasgow's not gone from building one satellite up to over 100 now, um, which is a fantastic rate of change um, and, and really something that, that the whole of the, the Scottish space industry should be proud of. You, talk, you talked about sort of all those different skill sets that you need in the industry. Were they in Glasgow? Were they in Scotland? Have, have people moved to Scotland for that combination of great lifestyle and 
opportunity. What have you recruited? I think it, it's certainly been a mix. We've we've had people moving over. Um, Scotland is is definitely a, a nice part of the UK and the world to live in, um, with with the Highlands very close by to to Glasgow. Um, we've benefited from having uh, fantastic universities who have adapted as the the space economy has grown to delivering more and more courses around space data analysis and. Uh, the the satellite systems engineering and the building of the satellites themselves. So I, I think that it's been it's been a build up of capability, um, and it's starting from this nucleus of a vision that we should have satellites here in Scotland, and that we can then start building the whole of the value chain. So now it's not just satellites and it's not just the, the data analysis. We're now looking at the launch capability as well, which was something that even when, when we were launching the first one back in, in 2014 and seeing the launch capabilities of, uh, of the former USSR in Kazakhstan and, and seeing these, these huge complexes. And now it's fantastic that, that we can start seeing those start to emerge within, the, within Scotland as well. Marion, do you want to comment on that in terms of the universities and the capabilities that you've been able to bring to bear to this sector? So I think the, the critical thing really um, in terms of how we grow the space economy and how it has grown is, as Steve has said, having a, effectively a, a skilled workforce. Um, and that means skilled all the way through from the construction through to actually, the, as we said, the, the jobs where we're actually looking at um, the data and using it and developing the methodology which can be done. And, and as Steve has said, you know, um, Scotland's a relatively small country. We have quite a lot of universities who are used to collaborating together and while sometimes we can be slightly slow um, we can also be very uh, rapid in our feet in terms of um, adapting and changing and developing new courses and training which fits the needs um, for the, the, the requirements and, and the gaps that we can identify within these different sectors. Um, I think though that it's not just universities it's more generally because as Tom said um, in the, the business trends is concern about governance. There certainly has been an increasingly, I think, globally, and certainly we can see it within the UK and Scotland, much more discussion about data and how data can be used and how it can be shared. Um, and so I think in that sense, um, people do talk about data in some senses being the new oil, um, but in actual fact, I'm not sure that that's such a useful analogy, but it does reflect the fact that that data has a substantial societal and individual benefit. Um, and it's really up to us to think about the structures and the regulations and the management that will give everyone confidence about how data are being used and how we can all benefit from it. Brilliant. I'll come to Phil and then to Tom on this one. So Phil, you've had a sort of an EMEA remit. So you know what's going on across the whole of Europe uh, and into the Middle East and Africa. I, uh, a polite question, why Scotland? What's your take on that? I think what we're seeing is a lot of our customers across the spectrum of services from uh, launch, exploration, satellite solutions, satellite communications. Um, there's a real, there has been a microcosm. So a recent customer like Ashtasat, who we deal with in, in Scotland, or craft who are obviously looking at different aspects of it. It's quite a diverse range uh, of organizations that are emerging. Um, I mean, going back to Clyde Space, I mean, Craig Clark, I know, is a, is a very well-known individual in the region, and he sort of set out a stall some years ago um, in terms of innovation and development. And I think that spirit of innovation, which we embrace on cloud, we see that recognized in the region. What I'm actually really super excited about, Robin, is the companies we haven't even heard of yet. Um, and those companies come from uh, research institutes, uh, academic institutes, and st whether it's Strathclyde, Glasgow, or Edinburgh, uh, they've all been involved for quite a long time. It, this, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and uh, I know Marianne referred to training the next generation. Um, when I, when I kind of look back at my education, um, we were lucky to get one satellite image and entire PhDs were written about it, and it was quite a niche, niche activity. Now it's much more mainstream. And what we're witnessing, it's not just graduates from Earth Observation or space technology, but business graduates, marketing, digital. 
they're all coming into this industry. And I think in Scotland, we're seeing more and more, whether it's uh, uh, new space startups or whether it's rallying around the, the space ports that are being developed, um, you're seeing a lot of that industry, uh, sort of that academic uh, know-how and uh, being passed on to the next generation um, and in an environment where we're seeing, say, customers on AWS appearing all the time. And I'll go back to my final comment is it's the customers we haven't seen yet. It's the customers who will be born in the cloud uh, that are really the most exciting ones. And as, as Tom said, uh, this time next year, we'll probably be talking about another 50, uh, for, I don't know, 20, 30 companies uh, will have come into being. Um, and the final comment which we're seeing is the European Space Agency's investment continues. The ESA BIC in the region, I know that tech that is establishing itself. We've got the regional um, catapults as well. Um, I know the offshore wind farm activity in the area. That technology all benefits from Earth observation and space technology. So if you add all that up, the sum of that parts is going to be quite a substantial and exciting um, coming years. Brilliant. Tom. A comment on that? Well, I think the so a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is the launch capability. If you think about launch, and I've been at many launches that have been scrubbed. And why are they scrubbed? They're scrubbed either because the weather is bad or because there is danger to citizens. So Scotland is well positioned, uh, has a lot of coastal, so you can it's easier to launch over an ocean because if something goes wrong, it's less risk. Um, it's also, uh, it can go into geocentric uh, orbit or polar orbit. You can do vertical launch, horizontal launch. It's a, I think that's gonna be an area that will be intensely interesting. Um, you have a few companies that are doubling down on uh, launch today, and some that we haven't even heard of yet to Phil's point. I think the other barrier here is with all of these satellites and all the data coming down, we have to figure out how to get the data down and track the data, and track all the satellites. I think that's an area of innovation that's still coming. Uh, perhaps cloud computing goes into space itself. And that's something we're thinking about. Uh, can you reduce the latency by having interspace craft communication uh, and downlink it where they are? Uh, there are things like the delay tolerant network, which is an open source where uh, JPL and NASA extended internet into space. That's a possibility. Could you control a spacecraft through email? Uh, another one is the space debris that I mentioned. Uh, Amanda Soloway, uh, the science minister of the UK, just uh, in the G7 nations, that's just in June, said that space debris is a real problem and everybody, all countries and nations need to band together. And I've been seeing some interesting trends that the UK can be one of the major spacefaring nations. There's a lot of innovation happening in many different places. Scotland has others. So I think in the end, I think this enables us, humanity, to and these new innovators to stand on the shoulders of giants, not in the years like we did before, but in minutes, because the data is available and the smarts is available and it's just limited by imagination. So I think we'll see the space bubble grow much faster than I can even imagine. It's interesting you mentioned sort of the G7 and Cornwall, because of course in November, the eyes of the world will be on Glasgow for COP26. So uh, w though I'm sure they'll be talking about satellites, Earth observation. What, what are the opportunities there for the, for the space economy in Scotland? in particular, of uh, bringing that huge community to the city. Um, I'll, Marion, do you want to kick us off on this one? You must be very excited about it. Yes, indeed. Um, in fact, um, there is a, a network of UK universities called, um, well, effectively, it's called the COP26 network. Uh, and we've actually just produced a, a, a briefing document on the use of Earth observation to address some of the climate challenges that we, we have, which are clearly global. Um, and I noticed as well in the last couple of days that there's just been a new report launched jointly between the IPCC that deal with climate change and the IPBES, which deals with biodiversity and biodiversity loss. And the point is being made that these two major challenges to our planet um, come together 
and that we need technological solutions to help address um, some of these issues. Now, I'm not suggesting that technology will solve everything, but I'm a great believer that if you have the information, then you can begin to make better decisions about what is changing, how any interventions are impacting those changes, and how we might work towards the targets that are being set, whether it's the Paris Agreement or any other agreements that we currently have. So I believe that data um, lie at the root of many of these um, solutions that we require. And I believe that Earth observation is just a fabulous way of actually um, delivering uh, those data. Um, not clearly, um, it's not going to be looking at the water bowl living in the River Clyde, um, for instance, but um, it gives us that global picture. And if we supplement that, as Tom has said, with some of the citizen science aspects, then we have, a, I think, a fabulous kind of confluence of essentially high tech, but also means of engaging the much wider societal um, communities in working together. And Tom made a really, I think, very important point about we solve these types of problems by bringing together different disciplines, different knowledge sets, different experiences. Um, it's not just science, it's many other um, different areas that have to come together to, to allow us to address these major issues. And that's really where I think Earth observation, um, it's not the only source, but it's a really significant one. And the new generations of satellites are, are just changing our ability to look at scale within our world. Um, Steve, I come to you, also based in Glasgow. Uh, is it all good news, COP26, when it comes to space and technology? I noticed in the Q&A that Jacob Billingham was sort of saying, you know, what's the balance in benefit between putting more satellites up to understand, to observe the Earth more carefully versus the kind of launch environmental mm -hmm. damage of sort of launching those satellites in the first place. So it, do you yeah. think COP26 is all on board with what you do, or do you think there are some sort of balances in there? I think that by making observations, then we, we can draw metrics and we can evaluate the impact that we, we have in various different fields, not just in, in carbon, but also in, in other environmental, social, ecological impacts. Um, and so, yes, it will always be a balancing act between the, the good and the potential negatives that we see. Um, for, for myself and, and my own experiences, um, what, we, what I see as, as really positive into the future is, is about this idea of connecting us as, as the kind of data rich economies with, with the data poor and ensuring that there's, there's already, there's, there's still 50% of uh, the world without the internet, without without that access. And there's still many, many human barriers to, to getting that data and turning it into something which is actionable on the ground and connecting it with that human lived experience on the ground. So I think the really exciting thing um, is, is, is in that um, connecting the us and everyone together so that we can um, create data sets which which will have um, a known impact, not just here, but, but across the world. Brilliant. And Phil, I mean, obviously a background in geospatial and, and, and data, what's, what's your take on COP26 in terms of showcasing Glasgow and the capability of the city? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that, Robin. Um, we're actually supporting uh, one of the catapult um, uh, projects at the moment, the Hack the Planet, um, with support and credits and, and capability. Uh, one of the things that we try to encourage and support our customers to do globally is to think about innovative ways of solving real world problems. Um, and so I think that that will provide a focus. Um, in that instance, it's a focus on oceans in particular and the blue economy. Um, the, the ability in that particular instance, the 54 nations of the Commonwealth to start thinking from a connected point of view, the ability to take advantage of infrastructure and global networks now that somebody in Australia, working with somebody in Glasgow, working with somebody in India, actually the opportunity is where they can join data pieces of data together and create applications and services. I think that can only drive good. 
I think it can only drive insight. And we talk a lot about data, and that's going to be a, a regular topic, which Marion obviously raised again, is there is so much data out there. It's the information and the insights you get from it. Um, but at the same time, we have to have the people connected together to, to come up with those uh, um, answers. And um, whilst obviously at this time where we, we can't travel anywhere, what we're seeing with this, as I mentioned earlier, this titanic shift to cloud is that the reality is it is now possible to start driving insights um, from this data. Um, it, it's so much, it has so much available to us. Um, and what we want to start doing is innovate faster, be agile. Um, and then when we do get uh, insights and outputs, then we can go global in seconds. Um, and, and I think that's really something that as the, uh, as the, the conferences move forward and as the new satellites are launched and it's not just Earth observation, it's IoT that we're seeing. We're seeing um, uh, quantum key distribution work that Steve's doing. Um, when you marry all these things up, I think that the outputs and answers that we're seeing coming forward in the next couple of years will be really powerful um, and i'll go back again it's the companies that we haven't heard of yet that's also super exciting to me and i think that's what we'll see more of um, and what's particularly interesting and i saw that R R richard branson did, a, did a, a, a cast recently talking about the importance of earth observation science um, when i was at university it was sea surface temperature uh, climate modeling weather modeling and we are, we are actually we're awash with data that we can see more insights faster and quicker uh, and i think all these things are going to keep coming up time and time again and it's great to hear the senior leaders um out there aggressively taking the approach that it, you know it is happening it is real the data is here so let's take advantage of it and start getting some answers out so uh, it's a great time for all of us it, it feels like a little bit of a a new space race i just there's a Note in there from Ravi Vetsa uh, in the Q&A just saying, you know, kind of is there a light regulatory sort of process we need to start building into this? You know, uh, just people going to throw it. We've talked about space junk. We've talked about lots of new satellites. You've talked about vast amounts of data uh, that's available. What What's the view, Tom, from from your end on on, you know, regulation of because obviously a good space race is all about entrepreneurial creativity brilliant you know genius academics you know imagining the future and uh, you know some people will be nervous about it other people will be worried about open data privacy you know uh, all those sorts of issues so have you got a, a take on that tom yeah a couple i think when you look at true innovation it, it there is a top down view uh, forgive me one second there is a top down view that sets the vision and I think that comes from governments or big business. Uh, and then there is the entrepreneurial that fulfill that vision. So I think you need both. Um, and I think, for instance, uh, when NASA launches a spacecraft, they always save enough fuel to have that spacecraft burn up in the atmosphere of a planet nearby. So they don't create space junk. I think the same thing needs to be, there needs to be an international collaboration that say, if you are launching a new satellite, how are you ensuring that that does not become space junk? So there are some regulations needed there. Um, and you don't want to over-regulate, but you want to regulate the really important part. And regulate by having an international agreement. There are already international standards that can be used. Uh, but are there international regulations that people will trust? I think that's an area of innovation. The other part, I think, if I were in Glasgow, Marion, what I would do is for the COP, uh, 26, I would issue a challenge. I would issue a challenge to the city, the universities, and say, let's demonstrate something during the conference uh, and select the winners and then show something that opens the high world, eyes of the world, uh, whether it is looking at how much heat the buildings emit that some of our startups are doing or something. It comes back to those ideas that we can't even imagine yet. So an ideation session, a building session and then a demonstration during the conference and i think that would go a long ways and it's it's not that impossible to do so challenge gauntlet thrown i 
have you you've probably got something in mind marion have you already that you're doing during the during the cop 26 well i think um i think university in scotland will be planning a whole host of different types of activities um as i said our interest has quite often been focused on water um, and quite often people think of scotland as being a a country which is very rich in water but it's actually surprising um i have a, a project currently funded by one of our national research councils which is actually looking at soil moisture in the um, northeast of scotland which surprisingly over the last few months has been very very dry and if you're trying to grow different types of crops then you need to know about this so that you can plan your irrigation and if you're regulating water usage then you need to know when the farmers are going to need to you know draw water from the local rivers and so on so the the whole challenge that we have here in some senses is both local but something also which scales out to be, to be global uh, and i think everyone's very excited at the prospect of what um you know what we all will be trying to put together to showcase um the the power and potential of the research that we do with the, the resources that we have and whether it be satellite data or indeed other forms of um, resource Steve, do you want to tell us, tell us what the plans are for COP20? Uh, we've been working on uh, with another company, uh, Resilience Constellation, looking at sensor gaps. So where we can develop and integrate new sensors within um, existing satellite networks to add value, to provide additional uh, capability and knowledge and information that, that we can use in these these new metrics for carbon for ecology so that will be um, an exciting an exciting uh, area for for us to be exploring at cop 26 we'll we'll also be um, looking to present some of our work on on geothermal plants and the environmental and social impact that we can actually measure from space um, where we've been working in kenya with with some of the tribes people there um, measuring on the ground and using using the uh, mobile phones that they they have to to capture what's happening on the ground and then relating that to what we can observe from space. So I think there's there'll be a few uh, ex exciting uh, moments for us at COP26. And Phil, sorry, um, yeah, I mean I think as I said at the start, I think there's there's a lot of act going on at the moment. Um, a lot of what we do. Obviously, as an organization, we listen to our customers. Um, so much of what we, we create in terms of services and respond to is what our customers are asking us for. Um, the environmental organizations, um, as I mentioned earlier, the blue economy keeps coming up time and time again. It's, it's, um, it's fascinating when you get leadership um, rallying behind a, a topic and a cause, and that leadership then actually aggressively pursues it. I think when it comes to our industry as a whole it's taken us a very long time to kind of get that momentum but now it's definitely there and and getting that support at top leadership level means that a lot of research and development work which has gone on before can now actually be applied on, on, a, on a repeatable basis with a higher degree of accuracy um and i think tom uh, my colleague mentioned about latency as well uh you know the days of I said at the start, you know, getting one satellite and image and entire PhDs being written around a single satellite image, uh, thankfully are gone. I, I think now the ability to get an image a day um, is, is such that um, being able to track shipping, being able to track, uh, you know, locations of wind farms, ideal solar panel locations. Uh, we mentioned things like peat bogs, I know, which is obviously a, a really valuable asset. Um, you don't have to wait a year for the next image. Uh, you get it now. Uh, and then coupled with that, um, the investment that is coming in both from government and the commercial sector um, combined means that not only research and science and can continue and grow and flourish, but actually the graduates, the trainees also have a commercial sector to go into. Um, and governments are always interested to see growth and not only business and commerce, but obviously also the research community behind that. And I think all of that combined is taking us in one direction on a continual basis. So I, I'm really excited. 
Uh, I am delighted that when I talk to people now in our industry, we have people who are coming in from uh, commercial suppliers, uh, manufacturing, marketing, digital. It, it means that we're, we're growing outwards and we're gaining more momentum. And the more momentum we create, uh, the better. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And, and I think COP26 is going to be another great step along that way. Brilliant. Tom, I'm going to come to you in a moment uh, for some closing remarks because we're, we are pretty much out of time. But um, just Phil, Steve, Marin, is there anything else you wanted to say that that you thought you were going to say when you joined today's annual lecture that you haven't, through my clumsy chairing, uh, not managed to say? Uh, so this is your moment and then we'll come to Tom for some closing remarks. No, I, I think I've covered everything that I wanted to, but I would just simply would, again, as we've all, um, really, this is, a, I think, a golden opportunity. Um, there are just so many opportunities for um, everyone, really, um, to get involved. Super. Brilliant. Tom, uh, we, are, we are nearly out of time, but we've got three, four minutes. Uh, for you to maybe reflect on some of the discussion and, and some other things you want to bring up. And uh, for those of you following in the Q&A, Tom has been uh, very uh, answering the questions that have been put out there. So do check out the Q&A for some links and other things that Tom's added during our discussion. Over to you, Tom. So I think, thank you very much for doing this. I, I think it's something, again, I'm repeating myself, but I think it's important enough to do. It's something that benefits all of humanity. And answering these big questions have been something we've been trying to do for 100 years. And I think we are at the precipice of being able to answer these questions through the participation of so many more uh, impressive people across the world. So I think that's really democratizing space is what this is all about. And uh, it's going from a passive observer to a passionate, active participant worldwide. And I think that's our job is to make that possible. So thank you for all of you who are watching and listening and uh, for all of you who will invent things we haven't even imagined yet. So thank you very much. And Tom, thank you for thank you for that finish. So uh, Tom Soderstrom, thank you so much for agreeing, getting up early in California and giving us uh, this year's annual lecture in Scotland. Professor Marion Scott, thank you so much for sharing insight from Glasgow University. Steve Greenland, thank you so much. Uh, sort of the entrepreneur, uh, as it were, in the room uh, based in Scotland. Fantastic uh, to hear what you're doing. Phil, thank you so much for uh, being, you know, being able to give us that local context uh, of what the AWS team are doing and also share some of your insights from, uh, from your previous roles. So um, that brings the event, sort of the, the stage part of the event to an official close. Uh, we'll return to the room now. The room is open for uh, till half past five. So if you don't need to run away, do uh, stay and chat. And uh, a recording of today's annual lecture will uh, go live on the DL Week site and will be sent out to everybody who registered and who was, wasn't able to attend today. So uh, on behalf of uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, thank you to all of you for participating today. And I'll take us back to the room. Thanks so much. <laughs>